All right, now I'm Steve Souders, <laughs> and I work at Google on latency. And normally, so I'm starting this series of tech speakers, and normally I introduce the speaker, but today the original speaker is gone, so I can't introduce him, and the replacement speaker is me, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Steve Souders. Here's Steve Souders. He works at Google on latency. Um, so in this, I just wanted to plug these sessions. Uh, a few weeks ago, the first speaker that I brought in was John Rezig, and last week we had a great talk from Doug Crockford, who's here today. Uh, it's nice to see him. If anyone has any follow-up questions, grab them af afterwards. And you can see those. I blogged it. Those videos are up on YouTube, and I blogged about them on the Google Code blog, so you can find those talks there. Uh, I've booked two more talks coming up. The talk today was supposed to be Rob Campbell, who uh, helps lead the firebug effort. Uh, he works at Mozilla. Um, but he was coming in from the East Coast and got snowed in earlier this week, so his trip got canceled. So he's rescheduled for May 1st. And um, in, on April 23rd, I think, Tenny Toyer from Yahoo will be here talking about her, uh, the Coding for Green project that she's involved with. Um, and as I get new speakers in, I'll let people know. So, okay, so let's get started. <clears throat> so I've been here about a year. Before that, I worked at Yahoo, and I started the Exceptional Performance Group there. And while I was there, uh, we would help teams uh, analyze their website and find ways to make them faster. And out of that came these 14 rules. And uh, we would evangelize those across the different teams, and we saw significant improvements in, in making in how websites got got uh, sped up. And so um, I was able to take those rules and share them publicly, and I did that in a, a, a variety of ways, and I still do that. So one was I, I uh, started this tool called YSlow, which is a uh, extension to the Firebug. Firebug extension, and you can download it and uh, run it on your site, and it tells you exactly, like, it gives you an overall score and then gives you details about exactly what's wrong. And uh, this has been much more popular than I expected. I thought we'd get maybe 10,000 downloads, and at last count, it was about 700,000 downloads, 100,000 daily actives. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then I uh, helped uh, work with Tim O'Reilly to start this Velocity Conference, um, and I serve as co-chair for that. So it's the conference uh, targeting web performance and operations, and last year was amazingly successful. We had twice as many people come as expected, and we're uh, gearing up for the second one. This year uh, is going to be in San Jose, June 22 to 24. I hope to see you there. Uh, last quarter, I taught uh, high-performance websites at Stanford. So it's another way that I'm trying to get the word out there, and the videos from that class should be available pretty soon. I'll blog about that when they're up there. And at the end of this month, month March 30th, right before Web 2.0 Expo, Doug and I and a couple other uh, author O'Reilly authors will be giving one-day workshops at um, this training set of training sessions O'Reilly is calling master classes. Um, so if people want to sign up, I think it's pretty small. I think it's only like 20 or 30 people can sign up. Um, so that will be March 30th. So again, trying to get the word out there about these best practices. And one of the other things I did was write this book, High Performance Websites. And it did pretty well, not as well as Doug's book. And, uh, but it did pretty well, and it's still doing pretty well. It's been out for about a year and a half. And in that year and a half, I haven't been sitting idle. I've been... Um, continuing to do performance research, and I want to talk about that today. And so, of course, that research, I think the book has been pretty successful in getting the word out there. So uh, in the background, I've been working on a kind of follow-up book, and I just got the cover shot for that uh, earlier this week. So I think this is a black buck antelope or something like that. I'm not sure. I know the greyhound is the second fastest land animal. Cheetah is first, but it was already taken. And so I have to look it up, but I'm guessing this might be third or top five uh, fastest land animals. So it's kind of apropos for the book content. And so it's even faster websites. We're going back and forth whether that's one word or not. 
And uh, here are some of the chapters that I've written for the book. And the first book was kind of thin. Uh, most people like that. Um, and these eight chapters would make a good book, but it would be very thin. And one thing that I think is really important uh, for the next year or two looking at web performance is JavaScript. And uh, I think I'm a, a really good hack at JavaScript, um, but we needed better expertise than that. And so I contacted people I knew uh, who were leaders in JavaScript and, and asked if they would be willing to contribute to the book. So there's six other chapters that these authors are contributing. And this, I think this is the first time that this has been announced publicly. Um, so Doug is gonna, uh, has written a chapter on Ajax performance. Nicholas Zakis, also from Yahoo, uh, an author and, and speaks a lot about performance uh, JavaScript, is going to talk about writing efficient JavaScript. Ben and Dion, the Ajaxian guys, have one creating responsive web apps. Uh, Dylan Sheeman of uh, uh, SitePen and Dojo is going to talk about Comet. He also runs one of the most popular Comet blogs, if not the most popular. Tony Gentlecore from Google is going to talk about uh, beyond gzipping, some accepting coding trends that we see out there. And the industry experts on images, uh, Nicole Sullivan and Stoyan Stefanov from Yahoo, have contributed a chapter on image optimization. So we're hoping to have the book out uh, in June of this year. Uh, and it's going to be tight. We're working hard on that. So today I'm going to talk about uh, four of these rules. I previously talked about, in, in my first version of this talk, talked about splitting the initial payload, loading scripts without blocking, and um, how don't scatter inline scripts, how inline scripts can affect uh, performance in your page, can harm performance in your page. And so I'm going to do a quick recap of loading scripts without blocking, because that's a segue into uh, how you couple inline code with that, those uh, asynchronously loaded scripts. And then if there's time, I'll talk about uh, flushing and using iframes. And we're on a tight schedule today because there's another tech talk at noon exactly, so we'll have to finish up by then. So let's get started. So why focus on JavaScript? So here are some of the Alexa top 10 US sites. And I've circled the JavaScript HTTP requests in their waterfall charts. And what we see is there's uh, sometimes a lot of JavaScript, or even when there's a small amount of JavaScript, it takes a disproportionate uh, to load time for the, of the overall page. So even though they might not be a lot of re requests, they uh, take up a majority of the loading time of the page. And that's because scripts block. They block uh, down parallel downloading and uh, rendering in the page. So here's an example from this gazillion website that's available if people want to uh, try it out. It lets you, the tagline is, because there's a zillion pages to test. So it lets you very easily, with like a page avatar, construct different test scenarios and see how they work in different browsers. So here's one that has a uh, two scripts at the beginning. Each of them take a second to download and a second to execute. And then uh, an image, a style sheet, and an iframe. And we see at the end that the image style sheet and iframe all load in parallel. And that makes the page load much more quickly, obviously. But we see that the scripts block everything else in the page while they download and while they execute. This was done in IE7, but it's true in almost all browsers. Some of the newer browsers uh, have this mitigated, but still not totally relieved. And um, so it's because of this that I think it's really important to focus on how we load JavaScript in our pages, and that's what I'm going to dig into. Um, so earlier when I was looking at these problematic websites in the Alexa top 10, I didn't show MSN, and that's because uh, if we look at their JavaScript files, they all download in parallel. And so the joke I always tell at this point, and if this is the exact same slide I used in the first version of this talk, so I apologize if you heard this joke already. So it goes something like this. Well, you know, this obviously is some collusion between the uh, IE team and the MSN.com team that the SEC should find out about because there's probably some secret sauce in uh, IE that MSN.com is taking advantage of. 
Um, but if we look at their source code, we find that that's not true. It's actually really straightforward. They're doing a technique that I call the script DOM element approach, where they uh, call document.createElement with a script, so they get a script tag that's created dynamically, and then they set the source. And it turns out in all browsers, if you do this, the script will be loaded and executed, but during the download part, it won't block anything else in the page. So, you know, this kind of piqued my interest, and, you know, I would listen to, uh, read blog posts and, and talk to developers. I came up with this list of six techniques that achieve this result of loading scripts without blocking the page, at least while the script is downloading. While the script is executing, the, uh, since browsers are single-threaded, the UI and other downloads are pretty much locked. Um, but uh, while it's downloading, at least, it would be good if a script didn't block the page. So there are these six techniques in, in the earlier version of the talk that you can find on the, on the Google Code blog. Um, I went into detail on each one of these. I don't have time to do that today. I'll just show the result. What we find is that these different techniques have different uh, traits, different characteristics, and there's really no single solution. It really depends on what you're doing. Are your scripts on the same domain as your main page? Do you want to trigger busy indicators or not? If you have multiple scripts, does it matter if they get uh, loaded and executed in a particular order, or does that not matter? And depending on those attributes, you have to pick the right uh, technique to use. And so I offered up this uh, flow chart where knowing whether or not they're on the same domain, whether or not you have to preserve order, and whether or not you want to trigger busy indicators, you can find your way to the preferred technique to use for loading scripts. So I got done with that chapter, and it was really good. Okay, now we're about to start the new part of the talk. So I got done with that chapter, and it's pretty good. And then I took a step back, and I realized it's pretty rare that someone has a page and it has an external script in it and all they need to do is load that script. It's certainly possible, but typically what happens is you have an external script in your page and you load it and then there's some code in your page, some inline code that calls the symbols, references the symbols or functions in that external script. So you have this dependency order or what I call coupling between this external script and your inline code, your inline embedded script. And so um, it turns out that if we load this script asynchronously and we don't pay attention to the fact that there's a code dependency, we get undefined symbol errors. So let's look at an example. So I, I built this page with all these examples of these different techniques and, and the impact they have and whether there's code dependencies between one file or two files. And so here's the default page. So uh, we, we uh, have a page that includes, so the, this list of examples is very convoluted. So I wrote this as, as an example for this exercise, I wrote a JavaScript file called menu.js. And what it does is you call a function and you pass in this array of uh, menu labels and menu URLs. And then it constructs a DHTML menu for you, right? So this is gonna be the example that I talk to uh, as I explain these different techniques. So, how would, so this is what a typical page would look like using this menu example. I would do a script source for menu.js, and then I would construct my array of menu items, and I would call init, which is just a wrapper around this function, to call create menu. EFWS is even faster websites, so I built like a little library uh, around uh, this code example. So, um, if we load that page, we get, get an HTTP waterfall chart like the one shown down here. Uh, this page also has one image in it. And because we're loading the script in the normal way, the script has to load, and while it's loading, it blocks the image. So then the image loads. So that's making our page slower because it's loading all these elements sequentially. So we could adopt one of these asynchronous loading techniques. This is the one that MSN uses, the script DOM element approach. So instead of doing script source equals menu.js, I can call create element script, set the source to menu.js, and add it to the head, append child to head. And then I have my examples and I call my code. And, and we get what we want we get the parallel loading works just fine, right? So this is really, really awesome. There's only one problem. 
When I load this script DOM element approach in Firefox, everything works, the menu works, but when I load it in IE, I get undefined symbol errors. And that's because the script DOM element approach preserves the order of external scripts and inline scripts in Firefox and some other browsers, but not in IE. So this is the exact kind of context for the purpose of this talk, of this chapter, is it's great to load your scripts asynchronously, but if you have code dependencies, either with other scripts or embedded scripts, you gotta figure out a way to couple those together so that you don't encounter this problem. And so we have these different techniques for loading scripts asynchronously, but the way that they behave and the way that you couple them can vary and have different uh, performance characteristics. So I wanna talk about, about those. So let's see, here's the, all the different asynchronous loading techniques. And what we see is there's no technique that preserves execution order and also uh, doesn't block downloading. There's no technique that works in all browsers. In fact, there's no technique just out of the box that will work in any browser except for script DOM element in Firefox. So if you just use these asynchronous loading techniques and you have this kind of uh, coupling dependency, if you don't pay attention to what I'm about to talk about, you're going to get undefined symbol errors. So let's dive into these coupling techniques. There's five of them, and we're going to talk about each one of them really quick. So hard-coded callback, these kind of go from worst to best. So hard-coded callback, so I have this init function that kicks off the menu creation. So what I could do is I could just um, uh, create my array, have the init function, and I could dynamically uh, create the script using the script DOM element approach. And in that script, menu.js, at the very end, I could call init. And so that's going to call back into this function that I built and create the menu. And it all works really well but it's not very flexible. Like if I change the init function to be do menu, then I have to go change that external script. And also sometimes you don't even have the ability to change the external script. Suppose you're using jQuery and uh, the init function is calling some jQuery symbol to create a jQuery dynamic menu or something else. Well, unless you want to host your own version of jQuery, uh, you can't add append a function to the end of the jQuery JS. So, this technique works, but it's very kind of hardwired. So you could tie something to the window onload event. So um, what would happen is you could load your script asynchronously, and uh, after it had loaded and everything else loaded in the page, the onload event would fire, and that's where we could tie, in this case, the init function. So here's what the code looks like. Basically, I'm uh, going to uh, here, I need the script DOM element approach doesn't block the onload event in all browsers, so I'm switching to a different async approach. I'm using the uh, iframe approach. So basically this menu, instead of menu.js, I have menu.php, which has all the JavaScript inside it. And so using this technique across all browsers will block the onload event until the JavaScript is loaded and executed. So now I can load the JavaScript this way, the onload event fires, and down here I attach There we go. Down here I attach uh, the init function to the onload event and have it work across browsers. Um, so this works and it's not too bad, it's not that heavyweight, it's not that complicated. But if you have a lot of stuff in your page, like suppose you have this uh, asynchronously loaded JavaScript and then you have 40 images that get loaded after that, it's gonna take a long time until the onload event fires. And so if this JavaScript is doing, you know, constructing some DHTML uh, controls in the page, those aren't gonna be available uh, uh, as quickly as they could be. And so that's kind of the main downside of this one is you're not getting that JavaScript uh, init function or bootstrap code uh, getting called as quick as you could. So you could do a timer. Uh, so what I'm doing here just for space reasons is I'm kind of minimizing the repeated code like creating the menu object and stuff like that and I'm just trying to highlight in bold the code that's changing for each of these different techniques. So in this one, I start a timer, and what this external script is gonna do, one side effect is it's gonna create this even faster websites uh, object, right? So in this 
uh, timer loop, I can just check for the existence of that symbol. And until it exists, I'm just going to keep looping through this timer, calling back uh, the, uh, to the code. And then eventually, when it does exist, I'll call the init function. So this works OK, but there's a little bit of overhead with this timer. Um, and if you make the interval value really small, that overhead will be worse. If you make the interval timer too big, we kind of have the same problem as we did with window onload. The code's not going to be called as soon as it could. Ideally, we'd like the init function, the inline code, to be called as soon as it possibly can, as soon as the symbols on which it depends are available. And uh, with this timer, on average, half the interval value uh, will go by before will be a, a missed opportunity or a delay between when this bootstrap code could be called. Um, and there's a little more maintenance, like if I change the, uh, the name of the object that contains this um, new code, then I have to change this harnessing, this coupling uh, code. So there's, it's not huge, but there's a little bit of maintenance involved. Um, Probably the best one is script onload, and this is probably what most of you were thinking from the beginning, like, oh, well, the way to do this is script onload. So there's a little bit of variability between browsers. Um, you uh, might have to do the actual scripts onload handler, or you might have to do the on ready state change. If you do both, it will work in all browsers, but in Opera 10 or 9 and 10, both of them will be called, so I have to add this onload done uh, flag, so I make sure that my init function doesn't get called twice. That's just for Opera that I do that. So this works. This works across all browsers. Uh, it's kind of optimized. As soon as the menu.js is loaded, the init function is called, so there's no kind of missed opportunity or delay. Um, it's a little more complicated. It's going to be a little bit more uh, code, number of bytes that you have to add to your page, but it's not huge. So this is really kind of the most likely uh, technique that should be used. But I wanted to mention one more, which I, when I first read it, it just really intrigued me. And I think it's really elegant. Um, it comes from John Resig. He calls it the degrading script tags approach. And his motivation was sometimes you have an external script and you have some inline code. And if the external script fails, sometimes that inline code will still execute depending on your browser and browser settings. And you'll get undefined symbol errors because guess what? That inline code depends on the symbols from the external script that failed to load. So his idea was uh, to do something like this. I've got my I've got my uh, script source call, calling a JavaScript file. In this case, you see I changed the name a little bit. You'll see why in a minute. Um, and between that open script tag and the closed script tag, I actually put the code that depends on this script. So this is really, really awesome. Now, the way that I have to get this to work is it turns out you know, this is really, really awesome, but it actually doesn't work in any browser. There's no browser that's built to work this way, to like pay attention to the code that's within the script blocks if there's a source attribute being used. But it turns out it's really easy across all browsers to add that. And the way we add it is by, oh, so this is nice because it's cleaner. Uh, there's only one script tag instead of two script blocks. It's clear, it's very clear that this code has a dependency on menu.js. Um, and it's safer. If the external script fails, then uh, the inline code won't be called. But it requires, since it doesn't work in any browser, you have to do a little work. And it's not that much work, and it's not that complicated. So at the end of menu.js, so that's why I renamed it to menu degrading JS. So at the end of menu degrading JS, I basically just do this loop. I get all the script elements, I loop through them until I find the script whose name is menu J degrading JS, and then I look at its uh, inner HTML property. And that's basically going to be inner HTML is going to be this code right here and I just eval it. So uh, if, so let's look at, so let's look at this as an official technique. Here's how we would use it in our example. So in his example, he doesn't talk about 
using this with an asynchronous loading technique, but that's what I'm trying to get across here. So how do we combine these two? Let's load this menu degrading JS asynchronously, but have this uh, pattern where the JavaScript to execute is inside the script block. So here's what it looks like. I have a script, one script block. I'm gonna load the script dynamically doing script DOM element, but what I'm gonna attach to that uh, script DOM element that I create here, it's called DOM script. Uh, I'm going to set its um, inner HTML or text, depending opera is an exception here, so I have to set one or the other. And I'm going to set it to call init. And now, if I add that code that you saw on the previous slide to the end of menu degrading JS, it will find this call to init in a valid. And now we've done this coupling um, in what I think is kind of an elegant, very flexible and also very cool uh, way. Um, but obviously this pattern is not that well known. Um, and uh, if you have a third party script, like I mentioned before, like jQuery.js, this wouldn't work. But this is a kind of pattern. You could add that, that block of code at the end. Everyone could start adding this to the end of all their scripts. And if we did that, then someone would have the option of adopting a pattern like this. And if there is no code attached to the inner HTML of the script element, then nothing happens. There's no harm. But by adding that, it opens up a lot of flexibility for how people can uh, in integrate or couple code with external scripts. So I think it's kind of cool. But I recognize that it's not that popular. And yeah, question. Um, I don't, The loading doesn't start happening until you do a pen child. That's why a pen child is last. Um, okay, uh, so that's pretty straightforward, right? You have these different techniques, depending on your situation or preferences, you could choose one of these coupling techniques or the other. But this was also uh, a maybe simpler scenario. I had one JavaScript file and, uh, and some inline code that depended on it. What if I had two JavaScript files that, that the second one depended on the first one and my inline code depended on both of those or at least the second one? How do I handle that? And it turns out that's more complicated and it's almost unsolvable if the external scripts, it's unsolvable to achieve our goals if those scripts are on a different domain than the main page. So let me walk through that now. So um, the two, techniques that you can use to solve this is manage XHR if you're on the same domain or a combination of the script DOM element and doc write approach if you're on different domains. Um, I didn't see Doug wince when I said document.write. Uh, so let me change my, my compelling example. Um, so instead of having just menu.js, I have this new file, menu-tier.js. And what it does is it creates it's kind of hard to see, but this is now like a grouped menu. I didn't go to all the work to make it like slide out uh, cascading menu. But this is like a concept of a tiered menu. And so menu tier.js depends on menu.js. So in my code, I have to load menu.js, menu tier.js, and then I have to construct my uh, menu object array, and uh, I have this init function. I forgot to call init here. I would have to call init at the end. Um, and if we look, not surprisingly, we see that each of these scripts block everything else in the page. So menu.js loads, menu tier.js loads, and then the image loads. So we get a longer loading page. And what we want to do is we want to get a page like this. We want to get a page where everything's loading in parallel, but we don't get any uh, race condition or, or undefined symbol errors, right? So I have this, uh, I extended the even faster websites functionality to have this um, uh, load script XHR injection function. So this is the managed XHR uh, uh, code that I was talking about. It's using the XHR injection async technique. And let's look at that function. 
Um, so, so XHR injection works, it makes everything load in parallel, but it doesn't preserve order. So the managed XHR, the managed part of that is the part that maintains load order. So how do we do that? Uh, here's the code. And when the book comes out, I'll make all this available on my website. Um, so you call this function, you give it the URL to the script. If you want to have a callback and onload when this script loads, you pass in that function pointer. And you pass in true or false if you're going to load multiple scripts this way, does the order need to be preserved? So uh, the function's called. There's this uh, queued scripts uh, object, queued scripts array. And if the user said order matters, then we add a, another element to that queued scripts array. And uh, we, we create a unready state change function uh, for this XHR. And when the XHR reached ready state four, basically the XHR is done, the, the JavaScript response has been returned. Um, we go through and if order matters, we add this response text to the uh, element in our queued scripts and we call this inject scripts function, which I'll talk about in a minute. And if order doesn't matter, then when we get the response back, we basically just eval the response and call the onload associated with it. So, but we're kind of, in this scenario, I'm kind of focusing on a dependency order between menu and menu tier JS. So we do care about order. Let's look at what inject scripts does. Again, pretty simple. Like this is a total of 100 lines of code or less. Um, it just iterates through that queued scripts ar array. Uh, if it finally encounters a script that hasn't been, a queued script that hasn't been processed, it's, it sees if the response has been received yet. If the response hasn't been received, we have to kick out of this loop because we have to evaluate the responses in order. But if the response has been received, then we can evaluate that response. If that queued script had an onload callback, we'll call that callback and we'll proceed to go through because maybe we got some other responses for scripts after this queued script. They came back earlier because they're faster or closer or smaller or whatever. And they've been blocked by this one that we just evaled. So we'll eval this one and then do handle any others that are still in the queue. Um, so this is pretty cool. It preserves the uh, order that the external scripts are executed. It avoids any blocking behavior in the page. Uh, it's a way of coupling uh, inline code with scripts, external scripts that they depend on. Um, it works in all browsers and it doesn't work for scripts that are on a different domain. So. This is kind of problematic. A lot of us are probably loading scripts from the Google CDN Ajax libraries or yahooapis.com or we have a CDN service that is a different host name than our main page. So uh, we have to deal with uh, this other scenario where scripts are on a different domain than the main page. And unfortunately here, the news isn't good. There aren't uh, any techniques that do all three of these things that we want. We want to preserve the ex execution order of external scripts. We can't just load them asynchronously and have them evaluated in any order, in a non-deterministic order. The scenario we're talking about is where there's a dependency order. Um, and we also want the scripts to not block each other. And we also want the scripts to not block other resources in the page. And as we can see, as we get, you know, the most important one is preserving order. You have to preserve order or you're going to get errors in the page. And as we work from left to right in this table, we find that there's fewer and fewer options available to us. Um, oh, I didn't go across it there at the bottom. Firefox and Opera can use the script DOM element approach, and that works pretty well. Uh, especially in Firefox, we achieve all of our goals. Uh, in IE, um, I found a bug with script defer that I'm still waiting to, that I submitted, I'm still waiting to hear back on. Um, so script defer for IE looks like it might be the best, but until I get a response about this bug, I, I don't recommend it. And it doesn't help for Safari and Chrome. So for IE, uh, fall back to document.write. And Safari and Chrome, you really, for Safari 4 and Chrome 2, they load scripts in asynchronously regardless in most cases. So you really don't have to do anything. Or if you use document.write, it's going to be fine. It's going to be the same as if you did nothing. Um, so here's what load scripts looks like. 
Uh, so you, you call this with an array of script URLs you want to load. It does a first pass to see whether or not they're on the same, they're all in the same domain or not. And uh, based on that, it will choose the right function. By default, it's going to do XHR injection, but that uh, presumes that they're all in the same domain so that if, if they're not on the same domain, if they're on different domains, then depending on your browser, it's going to do either script DOM element approach or doc write, and then it will loop through all those URLs and load those scripts. So depending on whether they're on the same domain and what browser you're in, you're going to get uh, either all of these goals met or some mixed bag, but all of them will preserve order. Um, okay, so wrapping this one up uh, about coupling external scripts. Um, if you have a single script, there's a lot of room for improvement. You can use script DOM element. It works across all browsers. You can use one of the coupling te techniques. I recommend script on load. And you can, we really don't care about preserving the order of external scripts because in this row, there's only one script. Um, and scripts aren't, there aren't multiple scripts in the page, so we don't have to worry about that. And across all browsers, script DOM element will let other stuff in the page load in parallel. So if you have a single script, whether it's same domain or not, it doesn't matter, script DOM element works for both. That's a pretty easy scenario to solve. What if I have multiple scripts in my page, but they don't have interdependencies? Again, easy problem to solve, use script DOM element, and we achieve all the goals that we want. If I have multiple scripts that do have interdependencies and they're on the same domain as my page, it's a little more code to write and to download Load, but we can solve that with managed XHR and achieve all the goals that we want. The most problematic is if you have multiple scripts that have interdependencies and they're not all on the same domain as the page, it's kind of a mixed bag. There's code that can achieve uh, all the goals or some of the goals depending on the browser. Okay, so let's wrap it up with a case study. I like to uh, always get back to real world. I think Google Analytics is a perfect case study for this. So Google Analytics is a JavaScript file that's really popular. There's a lot of websites that use it. And it's the perfect example of something that can get loaded asynchronously. There's really nothing in the page that is depending on Google Analytics.js to get loaded, right? I'm not saying that, we, that users don't want to get this uh, Google Analytics information, but there's nothing in the page like drawing the nav bar or something like that that requires it. So this is the perfect opportunity, the perfect example of a file that should be loaded asynchronously. If we look at the pattern that's recommended on the Google Help Center for loading this, we see it uses the uh, document.write script tag approach. And this isn't the optimal approach that could be used because document.write blocks all the other resources in the page. So they also advise that you put this at the very bottom of your page. And if you do that, then the impact will be mitigated. But in looking at the top uh, examples of people using Google Analytics, I find that most of them are putting it at the top of their page. That's just where people are used to putting code like this up in the head. And when they do that and they use document.write, it's blocking all the other images and stuff that are below it in the page, the main content of the page. So um, it turns out when I poked around, and now Alex Russell from Dojo fame is working here at Google, uh, I think he mentioned it to me that there's this Dojo uh, urchin module that helps people address uh, this, these issues and load Google Analytics more optimally. And if we look at that code, oh, so I didn't put in any highlights here, but basically you can call this function to load Google Analytics and it's going to basically do the script DOM element approach. It's going to create a script element and set the source. And then what it does is the coupling technique it uses is the timer technique. So it's really cool to me to see this research that I've done and I've named these different techniques to actually see people who have adopted these techniques, not because I named them, but they're actually using them because this stuff makes sense to do for performance. So they're using a timer technique and that timer technique basically checks to see if the underscore GAT symbol exists. Uh, if it doesn't, it just calls the timer again. If it does, then it calls got GA, and got GA instantiates the Google Analytics tracker object. Um, so this is a, a nice optimization. If you use this, even if you put this at the top of your page, it's not going to block any of the 
uh, other elements in your page. So it's a nice optimization. Um, I emailed them and, and mentioned that the script onload approach would be a little bit better, and they might have actually changed their code by now. Um, so that's kind of a real world example of this stuff I've been talking about. Okay, so that was huge and long. I find presenting uh, that one chapter to be uh, uh, very difficult. And I, I hope I was able to do it in a way that you could follow and see some takeaways there. And I think one of the hardest things about presenting that is there's no single solution, right? If, if we try to find one solution that's gonna cover all of those cases, then we have to take the lowest common denominator one. And there are a lot of scenarios, in fact, I would say a majority of situations where that lowest common denominator uh, solution is inferior. So it's really a situation where you need to know the, uh, the context that you're in and pick the optimal technique for that context. So you might have to change things depending on you know, this page or that page. But if you want optimal performance, that's what you're gonna have to do. So now, that one was really, really long. Like, that was 20 or 30 slides. So I've got like six more slides to do the next two rules and then we'll be done. Um, so hang, hang with me here. Uh, so I wanted to talk about iframes. Iframes get used you know, a fair amount across the Alexa top 10. I think there's four or six sites that have iframes in it. And you know, the first thing I mention is that iframes just a priori uh, are really expensive. They're one or two orders of magnitude more expensive than any other DOM element you can think of. And so you just need to be a little cautious, like don't go willy-nilly about using iframes everywhere. If you're only using one or two, this extra expense of like 10 milliseconds just to create the DOM element isn't gonna be that big. But if you're doing, like in these, I just did 100 of these elements. I tested it across all these browsers. And like it was measurable. I mean, that's pretty amazing that just 100 was measurable to this degree. So, I mean, they have impact. You want to be a little cautious about, you know, just using iframes everywhere. That's why I say use them sparingly. Um, but iframes also have other uh, impact on the page. They block the onload event of the page. And we want the onload event to fire as quick as possible for multiple reasons. When the onload event fires, it says done in the status bar and other busy indicators turn off in the browser. So it gives the user a perception of a faster page as opposed to those busy indicators lingering on while you're loading an ad or uh, Google Analytics or something else in an iframe. So uh, we don't wanna block the onload for that reason, for the feedback it gives to the user. Also, still a lot of time people associate some uh, user behavior, UI behavior, to the onload event. So the you know, predominant one you'll see is focus will be set to the username field of the login form when onload fires. And I don't know about you, but I'm always like already clicked in the username field, type my username, tab to password. I've started tap typing the password, the onload fires, it sets the focus back to the username field, and I'm typing my password in clear text while people are looking over my shoulder, or even worse, like I'm up in front of doing a demo, and now people know my password. So. We still see that behavior. So since people are doing that, we want that onload event to fire as quick as possible so that whatever that UI thing is that's happening, it happens really quick. So now on some sites where I know this has been a problem, I sit and I wait till the page is fully loaded before I start logging in. And that's annoying. Um, so it turns out iframes block the onload event. Um, and, uh, and everything in the iframe, so if you have JavaScript or images in the iframe, the parent onload event won't fire until all that stuff is downloaded. Um, there's a simple workaround, unfortunately it only works in Safari and Chrome, and that's to set the iframe source dynamically as shown in this example. So um, I haven't done enough research to know whether just empty string or about blank uh, is the best value, but anyway, you create an iframe that doesn't have uh, a document, a URL, a source, and then you assign it dynamically. And if you do this in Safari and Chrome, it won't block the onload event from firing. Um, the other thing is not so much how iframes impact the page, but just to make people aware, the page can affect the iframe. So we know that scripts have this blocking effect, right? So here I've got waterfall charts for IE, Firefox, and then Safari, Chrome, and Opera all behave pretty much the same. And no surprise, if I have a page that has a script that loads an iframe and that iframe has some stuff in it, the iframe and that stuff are all blocked by the script, right? No surprise. 
But this is pretty surprising. If I have a style sheet below the, before the iframe, in IE and Firefox, that iframe is blocked by the style sheet. Now, normally, style sheets load in parallel with everything else. In fact, I think in the iframe, as an example, I put an image, a style sheet, and a script. And you see that they all load in parallel. But there's just something weird about IE and Firefox that they will not start uh, downloading an iframe or the iframe's components if there's a style sheet before the iframe. So if you have important stuff in your iframe, you might want to keep this in mind. And then it gets even worse. So you would think like a reaction to this might be to move the style sheet below the iframe. And if you do that, still in Firefox, even though the style sheet is below the iframe in the page, it will block the iframe. So it's just something to keep in mind. And another question I get asked is, you know, in, in mainstream browsers, you know, mostly IE6 and IE7, we only get two connections per server. And so uh, if I open an iframe, can I get more parallel connections? And the answer is no. So here's an example that has a page that loads five images and an iframe that has five images all in the same domain. And we see in IE7 that they're still blocked 2222. Two, two, two. So you don't get any more free connections. Um, uh, in iframe and its parent share the same connection pool. OK, so that was iframes. That was pretty fast. Now we'll do flushing really quick. Uh, so here's a page that contains an image, an image, and a script, right? And this is the way it would normally load. But if you flush your document early, you can get it to load like this. So obviously, it's a much, fa it's a much faster experience. So what does uh, flush the document early mean? So in PHP and in most other languages, like Python, uh, Ruby, Perl, there's a flush function or something with flush. In Perl, I think it's auto flush or something like that. And it basically means, so typically when some backend engine is rendering a page, it's sending stuff to standard out. And when you call flush, it be, and, but it gets, depending on the server and the OS, the stuff in standard out doesn't get sent as soon as it arrives. You wouldn't want to be sending packets that had eight bytes or something in it. So it gets queued up depending on the system that you're on. And then eventually when it is done or it reaches a certain size, it gets flushed and sent to the client. But you can manually cause that to happen, that flushing of standard out, by calling this flush function. And so that's what happens in this example. This is one of my examples. Just uh, after I uh, created the HTML document and put in the tags for the image and the script, I called flush. And then I went off and did something that took one or two seconds to execute. But since I flushed it, that got sent to the browser. And the browser, even though it ha doesn't have the full document, will start acting on it. But there are a lot of gotchas I find when people try to implement this. They say it's not working, it's not working. So just a list of some of these here. If you're using PHP, you want to check if you have output buffering turned on. And if you do, in addition to calling flush, you have to call OB flush and some other OB functions. It's fairly, it's, there's a lot of documentation on it. I won't say it's well documented. Uh, you have to make sure you have tra transfer encoding chunk turned on. And most uh, web servers will do this for you automatically. But one thing is this only works kind of pretty much in HTTP 1.1. So if for some reason your server is 1.0, you're not going to get the advantages of this. So these are all things I've bumped into people. They go, it doesn't work. I go, well, do you have output buffering on? They go, oh, yeah, I do. I go, then you've got to call the old B function. So, oh, it doesn't work. I go, oh, are you using some server that downgrades to 1.0? Yeah, I am. OK, well, you can't do that. You need transfer encoding chunked. So the next one is, in Apache, if you have gzip turned on, there's this 8K deflate buffer size. Thank you, Steve Lamb, for finding that one. And and uh, you have to exceed that or change the setting to be less than 8K. Otherwise, it will store up that amount of output to, G to do the GZIP compression. But you can achieve, and, and that happens for you with Apache 228 and onwards. But earlier than 228, you're going to have to muck with that setting. Another one is, are you behind a proxy? Uh, again, people say flush isn't working. I say, are you behind a, you know, are you, have output buffering on? No. Uh, are you gzipping? No. Or, or I'm on 228. Uh, do you have transfer encoding? Yeah, I do. Are you behind a proxy? Yes, I am. OK, so that's what's happening. Not all proxies do it, but Squid does it. Uh, and it's one of the most popular proxies out there. Um, and antivirus software do it. They might queue up the response um, and not send it until get, they get the whole thing. And then also in Safari, 
even if you flush, if you don't flush at least 1K of content and in Chrome it's 2K, it, even though it's flushed, it won't draw anything, it won't handle it, so you have to exceed that amount. And for real world pages, that might not be that difficult to get one or 2K if you have like the whole head and maybe a nav bar. And then one other gotcha is keep in mind that for, main, for mainstream browsers, mostly IE 6 and 7, you only get two connections per server. And most of the time, we only think about that in terms of the resources in the page. But in this case, the document itself is making a request. So here's a case where all of the resources in the page, no, not all of them, the first three, uh, well, the HTML document and then the two images are all on the same domain. And because they're on the same domain, the third, the, the third request, an image, gets blocked by the HTML document itself. So if you're doing flushing and you have more than uh, one resource that's on the same domain as the main page, you're gonna see that it gets blocked and you might wanna move it to a different uh, domain. Okay, so uh, I gotta wrap up really quick. Focus on the front end, run why slow. Um, here are some rules about JavaScript. I just went over some more. Speed matters. Uh, it's really important we have some stats that have been put out about how it impacts business metrics. Um, and so that's really important. It also impacts your uh, operating expenses like hardware and bandwidth. Here's a chart from Bill Scott at Netflix. This point is where they turned on compression and you can see the uh, outbound traffic from their data centers dropped in half. So you can save money that way. Um, so if you want to have a better user experience, more revenue, reduced operating costs, it's pretty clear what we need to do. We need to have even faster websites. So that, that's it. And I have three minutes for questions. Are there any questions? Well, yes. Uh, Google Analytics example, if you load the uh, analytics <laughs> JavaScript late, a little bit asynchronously, uh, do you increase the chance that you actually miss you know, the, uh, the, 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 the visit if the user comes away prematurely? No, I actually think doing this would make it less, so the question was, if you do the Google Analytics recommendation of loading it asynchronously, do you run the risk that, like if the user is clicking through the page really quick, they leave the page quickly, you won't get the beacon. And it's actually just the opposite. The recommendation um, for Google Analytics is to put it at the bottom of the page. So by the time it got to the bottom of the page and actually did that document.write, the user could have clicked off. By doing it this asynchronous way, you can, you can uh, feel okay about moving that Google Analytics to the top of the page. So it's actually more likely that the Google Analytics will be loaded sooner and the beacon will fire sooner. So you'll have less drop off. Doug. What's the likelihood that future browsers will do the script The question was, what's the likelihood that future browsers will do the script tag better so that we don't have such a performance impact? And we're already seeing that in IE8, Chrome 2, Safari 4, and in the latest Firefox 3.1 Beta 2. Um, and, but they still have some limitations, like in IE8, it will load all the scripts, it will download the scripts in parallel, but nothing else. So if you have script image, those are still loaded sequentially. So that just has to do with how far ahead they're looking in the stream to decide what things they can load in parallel. And with more work, they could look further ahead for the stream. In, I forget what it is, Chrome or Firefox, they don't recognize iframes. So they recognize images as something that can download in parallel but not iframes. They could add that logic. So we're already seeing that with the next generation of browsers and it will continue to improve. Um, so it's true, a lot of these techniques are mostly relevant as long as IE 6 and 7 exist, which is gonna be years. So I have at least a few more years of relevance. Last question. One of the things that you suggested was that libraries could add extra code at the end that uh, introspects on the page into which they have been embedded. Um, so in general, that kind of experience uh, ends up uh, coming back to bite you because uh, you're never able to anticipate well how your library is going to get uh, end up getting used. And I, I was not able to follow the example entirely, but one thing that did occur to me is if you, um, as a result of libraries adopting that, your suggestion was that, well, this has no, this has no effect 
uh, it does have an effect because uh, previously a div that had an ID that this library looks for, uh, just by looking at the HTML, you, you knew you were safe. Now suddenly, as a result of just choosing a, a weird name for a div, uh, you know, some piece of code could change the behavior of the page. In light of that, would you want to change your suggestion about whether libraries should adopt this behavior? Uh, so the question was, adding that little snippet to the end of every script in the world might lead to unexpected uh, behavior. And I uh, don't think that's true. And it, it was a kind of complicated example. I went through it quickly. So you and I should maybe talk some more. But if you in the code, it actually isn't looking at IDs. It's looking at the, at the actual name of script files. And so it, you know, the, the ID of a div in the page isn't even used in that code. And, and since right now, there's no browser that supports executing JavaScript within a script block that has a source, my guess is no one's doing it. So you could only have this happen if someone put code in a place where they're not putting any code now. And I think the only reason they would do that is they expected or hoped that uh, the library would support that technique. But we could talk more about that also. All right, thank you very much, and we'll see you at the next one of these. Thank you. Thank you.